at it again. Challenging day. It is four, four Celsius right now, which is right at around 40 degrees thereabouts. Look at this sky, it's beautiful. We got a storm once again, heavier than last weekend. Brought some rain and brought lots of cold temperatures. We're gonna be cold in the area for the rest of the week. <laughs> So it's gonna be a little below normal, but uh, with the proper gear, as you can see, you should can be able to manage. Yep, shouldn't be a problem. On this ride, Paul and I left Northampton, rolled into the woodlands. We we're going to pick up Laura and Mike, and I think Abby was joining us. But when we got there, it was a pleasant surprise to see Mo and some of the other WCC guys. So needless to say, the pace was fast through there more film but we had a glitch with the camera software it recorded in time warp mode as we go through towards gary so i was able to slow it down after the fact but you you can't get any sound or anything so we missed his commentary he had done some commentary in a tally and i thought that was cool but uh we'll get another shot at this because we uh added more to our group and hopefully he will come and join us in the future and whenever he shows up and you give him the camera that's the only thing that slows him down so it gives us a break <laughs> so we're hoping that he will be in the mood when he shows up and do more filming but he got some really good shots i slowed it down to where it makes sense you know you don't want to slow it down too much because it's like almost like time lapse but we also have some clips for paul and i returning with the tailwind so i think you will like what we put together for this week This is where we turn on the camera. We had no idea that it was filming in time lapse. It was really fast. It, they call it time warp. And it was a glitch with the programmable button on the camera. And we got that resolved to where we're going to be aware of making sure it does not occur again. Um, so we're filming along here. I, I was able to slow it down to where you can see we're leaving cross pizza area we met in the same parking lot that team rr meets in but we met on the southwestern end which is quieter because uh we're we're doing big rides and a lot of the guys that we used to ride with would complain so we set up our own little group chat and we're building a, a velo harmony group which i think is uh, going to attract people who want to do bigger rides and we're trying to keep it flexible to where Regardless of the speed, you're welcome. And when the group gets big enough, we can split the groups so that when people get tired from group A, they can drift back to group B and so forth and so on. But we have a central meeting place and the, the faster groups don't have to really wait for us. That, that's the long-term goal. That's Laura you see on the left there, that's Peter on the right. I could not get any stats on here because when it does time warp, what it does, it takes 18 minutes and it compresses it into a smaller time frame. So it drops a lot of frames. And, you know, and there's no way the software can match the data to it. So that's why we don't see anything. But I thought it was interesting enough to keep the clip and not throw it out. Uh, Mo is at the front. He's pulling. We're moving fairly quickly here. Not as quick as we will be moving in maybe a kilometer or so when we get to Egypt Lane. Mo's at the front talking to somebody. I'm probably next to Paul. We're probably we're doing a double pace line, as you can see. That's Peter on the right there. He's been riding with WCC for a while. That's Doug in front of Peter, and that's Kenny on the left there. So right here, when we turn, we turn into the wind. More takes off and all hell breaks loose. Well, you will see everybody goes single file right here. And we start zigzagging, meaning that the wheels are moving and you want to make sure you stay on the wheel. It's hard for you to appreciate it because of the speed of the clip. But uh, when we got to the light here, we realized that <laughs> it was going to be nice and fast. It was crispy this morning. So everybody's chatting. We're waiting on the light. And you can see Moore is at the front. In fact, when we were riding here, I was hoping, I said, man, somebody needs to get more off the front. Because when he gets off the front, the pace settles for a little bit until he gets back there. 
but we're doing about 22, 23 miles per hour into a headwind, the headwind that brought the cold front. And we haven't been riding like this. So uh, Paul just had trouble finding his rhythm. And I told him when I caught up with him later, when I waited for him, I said, there is no rhythm. They're just riding. I said, these guys, got they have no rhythm. They're just going fast. We're flying through here. So by the time we get to the corner coming up here at 2978, because we're going to go on Honia Egypt Road, we've already been going. It felt like a road race. So we turn over here. Boom. We're going again. And you will see us pull away from Paul. I'm not aware that we pulled away from him because I'm just focusing on staying close. Right here, we're sprinting again. And we're just gone. That's Kenny on the back there. Abby's in front of Kenny. And all I'm doing is I'm staying close to the wheel that I'm, that I'm on. I'm not aware that Paul is not with the group, but I've, I know we're going hard. We're more cognizant of these cars because they were behind us. We did not let them pass in our lane because it would not have been safe. You can see the other cars coming on the opposite side of the road. So right here, Paul has decided he's going to do his own thing. Now, more is going to wait. He drifts back to Paul. And he's going to try to pull Paul up. Well, the problem is when Moore drifts back for you, he's got to go faster than the group is going to catch the group. So you will see him a couple of times try to pull Paul, but then he's pulling away from Paul because he's going faster than the group back here. So then he looks back and then he's going to come. And Paul told me that he told him, Moore, go ahead. I'm, good. I'm just going to do my own pace. So Moore takes the camera here from Paul. And he's going to ride up to the group. Now, we're up there doing about 22 miles an hour, let's say. And we're going into the, the north wind. So he had to do at least 25 to 26 miles per hour to catch us as quickly as he did. He's chasing back to us right here. All of this is transpiring. I am not aware of any of this going on. He's going to catch the group. He's going to film. Then he's going to come up to the front and tell me that Paul is back here. And then we decide to wait when we get to Grand Lake Estates because we're going to be turning into Grand Lake Estates. You will see that in a little bit. So here he is trying to catch the group. So he's doing at least 26 miles an hour or more into the wind. And he's riding up to the group. So that's, that's the kind of effort you would do like if he had a flat tire or something. But usually you have a teammate or two to help you. But he rides up to the group. You see him stick his tongue out. That's why I hate that this happened. Hey, right there. <laughs> you probably missed it. He's going to sit and recover for a bit. This is Doug Shot. That's Mike Barrera in front of Doug Shot there. So he's trying to catch his breath. Now he's going to ride up and start filming the group. And you will miss what I told him because he films Peter here. Then he's going to drift back. That's Laura behind Peter. I'm on Laura's wheel. I'm going to tell him, man, you guys are killing us. That's what I'm telling him there. <laughs> and like Abby. And that's Kenny. And that's Mike Barrera and Doug Shot. So we had a good turnout. So I apologize for the, the glitch, but, uh, you know, they put a lot of tech on these cameras and with the cold weather and our gloves on, sometimes you can't feel the tactile feel of the button. There is a, a shutter button that pretty much you push and it starts filming right away. And we we didn't push it properly or something happened, but I went ahead and tested everything and we we got it sorted. So we turn here. Kenny's going to enter the code. Those cars don't have the code for this compound. And they were waiting. So we get through and then I tell them car back to move over. We're going to wait right here for Paul. So we're waiting. I told Mo, I said, man, you, you're doing 22, 23 into the wind. That's what we're talking about. Then Doug on the right there said, Mo eats the wind. <laughs> so we laughed about it. <laughs> Look at that son. So we're looking for Paul and the gate closes and Moore asks, does he have the code? I told him, yeah, he has the code. So in a little bit, Paul will show up. I was hoping he would find his legs, meaning, you know, sometimes like when you miss a lot of training during the week, you know, we're very, we're all busy and sometimes Paul doesn't get 
<laughs> I don't know what more is saying here, but we missed that because of this time warp thing they call it. So it doesn't record any sound once you go into time warp. So it basically took 18 minutes of the ride and put it into a three minute clip. Three minute, 30 second clip, something like that. So you see most filming in the group. And I think in a little bit, Kenny's going to go and start forcing the pace. So it's not just Mo that's doing it. These guys just ride at a quicker pace, and we're going to have to adapt to their rhythm and ride up to their level and be able to ride with them. So that's the long-term plan here. And that's how you want to, to do it. But you want to go faster when it's close to your objective. Let's say if, you, if you're a competitive cyclist, you don't want to be peaking too early. So November is not the time to peak. Let's say if your first race is in March, then maybe January you start going faster, you know. But down here and and uh, probably the southwestern part of the U.S., like California, other places, the weather is kind of nice all year. So I, it's hard for a lot of people to back off. It takes a lot of discipline. And so we have a lot of guys here that ride fast the whole year. But it varies. They're fast. If their fast is in their lower zones, then it's not that big a deal for them. It's not a bad thing, you know. But you got to make sure you're not riding at your limit all the time, you know, when you're not ready to really push yourself. So that was my, my focus was to make sure that they didn't continue to wait for us and ruin their day. I insisted they wanted to wait, but I insisted that they go. You know, they waited quite a few times. I said, you guys go ahead. Let, let, we'll do our own thing because it's like everybody needs to have their fun. But I wanted to kind of hang back with Paul because I was hoping he'd find his legs. You know how it is. You've probably been through the same thing. Let's say you miss a couple of rides during a week, and it might take you two hours to feel like a cyclist again, so to speak, on that next long ride. That's what I was hoping would happen. And he didn't really find his legs until after our break. After we stopped, we, we backed off, dropped the pace, and on the way back, he felt a lot better. And that's the way to do it because a lot of people quit cycling because if you're riding at your limit the whole ride, it's uh, mentally and physically is hard on you. And sometimes, you know, you you lose your morale or your motivation. So I didn't want him to ride his limit the whole ride. So we're going through Grand Lake Estates here. Mo was commentating and unfortunately we missed it, but we'll get we'll, we'll get many more chances. So we turn here on Linda's place, and this is where Paul will fall off. We're going into the wind again. And what happens is every time you go into the wind and uphill, the watts go up. I stayed really close. That was what you must do. You can see I'm on Peter's wheel. I am staying very close. We are working very hard here. You see that there's one line. And then somebody tells me that Paul's off the pace. So I pull off, and then Doug told me that they would wait. So I'm waiting for Paul back there. They're going to wait at the gate. There is an exit gate back there. That's Laura. And Laura told me she liked the pace, but she was working hard, too. And so if it's too early for you to push yourself, then you kind of sit in. That's Abby sticking his tongue out. You kind of sit in because it's early. It's November. And so, you know, if your, your big rides or races are not till March or later in the year, you don't want to peak now. So you don't want to do too much of this. You got to be cautious. A little bit of that is not going to hurt you, but you don't want to do too much of it. So I was in the group. I was in zone four. So it was for me, it was tolerable, but I made sure that I stayed close to the wheels. Most got the camera at a low angle. Looks really good here. That is cool. This is a hill before the gate. So this is where they, they, they said that we're going to wait. I don't know if that's us in the distance or not, but uh, I'm pulling Paul back. I don't think that's a mailbox. So Doug's trying to stay loose there. Because when it's cold like that and you stop, you know. Mo's saying something here, so we missed, we missed that as well. So the Tom Wap, I wasn't sure I'd be able to get it to where it was usable, but I, I used a, a software and slowed it down enough to where this was the best speed to be able to do what I'm doing with it here. Anything else, it would have looked 
either too slow or too fast and choppy. So we, we come through, I keep riding. We just kind of roll through. We're in uh, the Grand Lake Estate. So basically what had happened back there, we're on 2854 southbound. Okay. Once we left that uh, that place, uh, the Grand Lake Estate, we kind of let the group go when we got past Spring Branch because Mo turned off the camera in the neighborhood there after he saw us come through. He turned off the camera. So we stayed with them until Spring Branch, Big Hill, and then we kind of let him go. But he came back for us on Spring Branch and we rode with him all the way to the end of Spring Branch Road. Then we just told him, go ahead and go. And we took it easy. So we're on 2854 here, headed southbound. The wind did not shift. So for once, we got a bit of a tailwind. We had already, this is after our stop, just for help break. We didn't stop at a store or anything. We had everything we needed. When it's very cold like this, what I do is I hydrate before I get on the bike because I have a really tough time drinking when it's very cold. So I make myself drink before I, I, I get on the bike. I, so I drank like 20 ounces in the house. Whether you drink coffee, cocoa, whatever you're into. I made an electrolyte drink and drank 20 ounces of that. And so I did not need to drink early in the ride. So I only brought one bottle with 500 milliliters. So it's a pretty good size. And then later in the day, I made sure I drink. You have to drink. Otherwise, when you get home, you can be pickled with lactic acid. It's not good for your body to go too many hours exercising without drinking. So I'm gonna let him come and take some poles because since he's feeling better and we're keeping it steadier, the effort is lower because we're doing like 22, 23 miles an hour and we've got a cross tailwind. The wind is blowing from the north, which is behind us, and from the west to our right. That's why he's coming on the right, to give me some shelter as he goes by. And it's changing because this highway curves. Look at that sky. Is that beautiful or what? Look at that. I mean, it's just picturesque. It's warmer now, you know, 16 Celsius. I'm wearing only two layers. I've got the uh, Asus uh, Ultras base layer on and the uh, Rafa Thermal Jersey protein thermal jer jersey and I've got my ultras gloves the ultras gloves work for me for my range well from 40 to like 65 that's the best range and I don't have to take them off so if it gets below 40 then I layer my gloves someone had mentioned on the channel one member he said that he bought the ultras and it was minus two or whatever Celsius and it failed him well no one product can keep everybody warm in all temperatures because we're all different. And so I mentioned to him that you may want to look into layering because they, they can test a glove and say, oh, this is good to say minus two Celsius. But that's for that person who was testing it. You didn't test it. Everybody has different tolerances. So you gotta, you, you gotta invest the money and find a glove, but you gotta go out there and see. And if you're not sure, carry an extra liner or something. But I have tested these gloves to wear. Most of the gloves are great down to about, mm, probably five Celsius for me by themselves, the, the warmest gloves. And once it gets below five Celsius or below zero, I have to layer my gloves. To keep my hands toasty so you got to figure that out just the same thing with shoe covers for me i don't wear shoe covers if it's 10 c or higher some people some other people may need that and it depends on the direction of the wind as well so i cover my shoes anytime it drops below 10 c and it's not a warm directional wind day it's not blowing from the south or southwest. I cover my shoes because I want to keep my feet toasty. 
And by doing that, you know, like I was dressed perfectly for this weather today. Everything was fine. It did not overheat. When I was with those guys, I unzipped maybe quarter way down because I got a little warm when we're going hard. So we hit the, the, this road goes up here. This is near Adui on the right. We're not taking Adui. Because we have a nice tailwind here, I told Paul, let's stay on the highway. I want to give a shout out to one of our subscribers in California who is, uh, his name is uh, Michael, Michael Jones. He sent a message through Laura because he saw Laura on the channel. He's been watching us for some time and he wanted to make sure that this was Laura. He contacted Laura, Laura's coach and she just told me about it over the weekend. And so... Michael, I'm glad you're watching us. Yes, it is Laura. She's here with us. And we we're all we all reside on the same side of town. On the, we're in the north. The north north the northern suburbs of Houston. The Woodlands area. And so it was great to meet Laura and uh, you know, so yeah, I'm glad. Thanks for sending the shout out. So Laura stayed with the group. Uh, she sent me a message that she stayed with a group, but she was hanging on, and they they backed off periodically to kind of give her a chance to recover. And so it was fun. It's fun to do every now and then. You don't want to do too much too soon, you know. And when, when it's time for you to, to peak, then, yeah, you definitely want to look for it. So we're going to be riding with those guys. we got to find out where they're going to be riding from. If they join us, that's great. But if they don't join us, we'll see where they're riding from and try to hook up with them as well. Because later in the year, we definitely want to be doing faster rides. That's the whole point of building a base. So you can tweak it and kick it up. I don't know when it occurred, but in a few kilometers, we had a bunch of cars that came by and they were turning right. But right before the turn, they pass us and then turn kind of close in front of us to where we had to react to them. I wasn't too happy about that. It didn't make any sense. You think they would have just waited for two or three seconds for us to go through the intersection because they were turning right and they came and passed us as if to say they were going further on and then just turned. You know, it wasn't a dangerous situation, but it was kind of like, really? It, 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 was, it was close enough, let's put it that way. We had to stop peddling. You know, we didn't need a break or anything. You know, when I drive my car, it's the same thing. I don't, I don't get in front of another driver if I'm going to be turning right. Might as well get behind him so you don't disrupt his pace. <laughs> you know, but some people are just not as considerate. You, you know, in Texas, we say drive friendly the Texas way. Um, yeah, that's a nice slogan and everything. I think it should say be considerate, and that's probably what they mean. You know, if you're, if you're going to be turning, unless it's an emergency, don't get in front of a driver who's cruising. You're better off getting behind him so he can keep cruising. He or she can keep cruising, and then you can make your turns. But we get a lot of people in our area that will speed up just to get in front of you before they make their turn. And they were behind you already. <laughs> I told Paul I wanted to finish that little rise before I let him come through. I don't like to give people uh, the lead at the base of a climb necessarily. So at least he can find a rhythm. Look at this day. Look at that sky. So we did the same route that the group did because I posted a, 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 a you know a route. We did the same route that they did. Uh, we even went by Taco Corner, even though we did not stop. We went by to see if they would have still been there, but they weren't. And so once we got out here, we just stayed on this highway. We didn't go through Mill Route, Raven Chapel. 
which are a little quieter because of the, the direction of the wind in a little bit is going to turn more eastbound and once it does we're going to get pounded by the north wind which will be coming from our left and right now the the, the the westerly flow of the wind is pushing us north you know it's coming from the northwest you can see my watts are very low pulse punching a hole in the wind we got a tailwind pushing me i'm not even pedaling here this is slightly downhill we're, we're, we're going home quicker with less effort than when we're heading out because we're fighting that wind that's pushing us now. Earlier this morning, we're fighting the wind. Careful, my brother. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. Geniuses. It's like, you know, you see us there. We're moving at 25 miles an hour. The intersection is right there. All they had to do is back off. Both of them were turning. They just turn in front of us like we're invisible. That's just inconsiderate and rude. And they do that to people in, in cars and they wonder why. Then they say, oh, rude ridge, because some people are, you know, some people, I guess, their cup is full and they shoot at other people for stuff like that. I mean, I don't think that's necessary, but that's what happens, you know. They annoy other drivers to the point where those drivers overreact and then you have incidents. The things that they wouldn't do if they were walking, they do it because you're in a car surrounded by metal and glass. I guess they feel they're disconnected. That, that shouldn't be. We all need to uh, be aware and cognizant of each other as we move about and do our daily activities. So yeah, I'm not using much watts because slightly downhill and downwind. And this is a fairly flat road. Carbac. I'm telling Carbac he was going to pull off. And he just held his position. It's a small shoulder. So I pulled through. Yeah, with the gloves on, it's hard to feel stuff. And uh, I think... I end up losing some of my trash. My pocket is full of trash because when it's cold, I don't renege on eating. I eat off it because I need the calories. Um, solids as well as taking gels. So the, this kind of riding I'm doing here is more of a steady kind of riding. And the WCC guys, they they ride like road racers. So it's like every corner, there is an acceleration back up to speed and they hold the speed high. And they attack climbs. So in a way, it's like an interval session, an interval training session, which mimics what happens in competition. So that's the style of riding that we have to adapt to and so we can ride with them longer that's our long-term plan because they don't back off when they come to a, a an overpass or let's say a a, a, a grade I don't think they even downshift. <laughs> I think they just push. You know, somebody might stand, but another rider will just push through the gear. These guys, you know, they're just, they're pushing the limits. They're pushing themselves. So to ride at that level, you want to train in the manner that they are riding in. You know, you got to train the same kind of style. You got to do intervals. So you're used to the repeats that's what gets you so you can teach your body to recover push recover push it's a different kind of metabolic activity and it's hard physically and mentally so you got to really be you know enthused 
about it to do it. That's the benefit of riding with the group, because the group will push you. You don't have to think about it. But ambitious riders, yeah, they'll push themselves. So that's the style. You have to change the style and do the specific workouts. But by riding in that manner frequently, you will adapt. The wind's blowing from the left, so it's slowing us down. I mean, it's really pounding. And the goal here is we're going to get to Hodia Egypt Road, and we should have that behind us mostly, except for the one. So we got wind from the left, strong crosswind, and then wind from the west behind us. It's not as strong as the one from the left. That northerly flow is what's bringing in the colder temperatures. And it didn't back off. This is a grade right here. It may say zero, but I think it's more like 1.5 or something like that. It's up. It's going to start leveling in a bit. I'm staying right in zone two right now. Yeah, now I showed 2%. Trying to get, I think I'm trying to get a gel or something out of my pocket. I would end up losing some of my trash because the, with the gloves on, the feel is not there. And that's why we had the problem with the camera. Our feel was off. So we've got things set up to where we won't have to rely on that anymore. There's a button that's automated on the camera to where it's a one touch. So it will come on and record at the same time. So that, that takes care of the issue we have. I think I end up losing a piece of trash. I just saw it. I didn't realize it when I when it happened because I couldn't feel it right there. I, I didn't feel that fly off. And, you know, it's like the wind is really blowing. It, it is just you can see how easily that thing flew away. It's blowing from the left. And when it's cold, you need more calories. So don't eat like you usually do in the summer. You definitely want to eat if you can tolerate it before you head out. You know, a nice little oatmeal, muesli, something that will stay with you. But if you don't, then at least have an electrolyte drink or maybe cocoa, whatever it is you're into. Some people have coffee, whatever. Start, start your system by putting something in there. It's kind of like getting the engine turned on. It's still a slight grade, and you hear that wind. It is really blowing. So when I was riding with the WCC boys, my legs were screaming because really I had not, not, not that I not only planned to ride that fast, it was it took a little bit for me to adjust and, and what I did was I stayed close to the wheel I was following I did not take a pull at all so even though I was working I was fine but I was thinking man do I want to do this for four hours <laughs> you know because I was thinking man we're going to Dacus I said I don't know if I want to do this for the whole morning you know
This is where we turn downwind on Honia Egypt Road. One of my favorite roads in the area. It's a oh, narrow. Yeah, we got we got a tail in here perfectly. I think we'll come up. I told him we're gonna stay on this road all the way into town. I think I used this opportunity to take a drink or something. This is, uh, it says four hours up there, the duration, but this is more like five hours into the ride because we started the camera almost an hour into the ride, let's say. So probably four and a half hours into the ride, something like that. When we start, it's still dark, so we, we don't turn the camera on. And if you don't turn the camera on at the beginning, the duration is off. It excludes the duration until it's turned on. The duration starts going. Even if you turn it off after that, it still remembers that. Yeah, he's blowing because there's a truck parked here and he's passing in that lane. We, we saw it would have made too much sense for him to wait knowing that we needed to do this. That's the stuff I'm talking about. They're always in a god of a hurry. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why that got parked over there. This is not a truck-friendly road. Car back. I mentioned car back because he was drifting to the left. I wasn't sure what was going on because he could see him too. The, the guy that I said car back for decided to wait because his sight lines are compromised. So obviously he's a very intelligent, good decision maker. Because some of them will try to go. And there's Paul's waving him around. Because we can see now. That's why some drivers will wait. That's what I do when I'm in my car. It doesn't matter whether it's a cyclist or whoever. There's no benefit to passing dangerously because you don't gain that much time. Just the laws of physics. To gain time, you've got to drive at a sustained, drive or ride at a sustained speed for at least, let's say, 10 kilometers or more. So if you think about it, if you're in the city area where you're not going anywhere far, passing someone, getting to the next stop sign saves you no time. So if you take risks, driving around the time it takes for you to get out of your car and close the door you have lost any time you think you gain even if that person doesn't see you you don't gain any time we studied that in physics in school you have to travel at a sustained pace for long enough to gain time so you're going to gain time on a long highway drive you're not going to gain time going to the corner store shutting the door getting out or going to work and taking out your briefcase the time you do all of that you've lost any time you think you gain taking chances so don't take chances you get out of the house if it's late call work and say hey guys i'm running behind so you can enjoy the drive instead of stressing yourself out because you're not going to gain time on the road you leave late you're going to get there late it's still going to take some time and it might be different depending on who else is using the road there are always people out there people dogs whatever but people don't consider that. They don't think that those kind of things through. So I, I don't rush around. I guess I've lived long enough. You know, I'm past my rushing stage. I don't rush around and I don't get in, in, in front of people who are rushing. Even when I'm in my car. They're in a hurry. I change lanes. Let them go on by. I don't want to meet the body shop owner. <laughs> you know what I mean. I let them go. I get out of the way. If they're riding my, my bumper too close, I get out of the way. Go follow someone else. I've got better things to do with my time than waste it renting a car or all the crap that you have to deal with when you have a crash. 
Yeah, this part of the road is shaved it, so we try to use the little smooth pavement here. This is about a 2% grade, and it's nice and steady. It's fairly long, but we've got the wind behind us, so it's not that bad. Keeping the effort in zone two, about 160 to 220 power-wise. That's the normal range that I figured. It's like zone two for me. There's a car back. I'm waving him up. I can see up. It's clear. I only do that when I'm sure they have enough room to get around because, you know, if it's a big group, you got to make sure that they got enough room. Because Moore had mentioned one time, yeah, what if you do that and something happens? So he doesn't like to wave them up. He wants them yeah. to make the decision. But then sometimes they make the decision at the worst times. They would sit behind you when it's clear and then try to pass you when it's not very safe. You know, probably happened to you. I don't, I don't, so if it's clear like that, especially if it's just me or just the two of us, I wave them around. I go on. Because they get too impatient. Some of them, the patient ones, will back off, give you a lot of room, and just follow. You can tell. So those I don't worry about. But we're always keeping our eye out. You know, one of our riders, uh, Mary Walker, was hit. Some guy turning left into the group on Fish Creek. Right where we start our rides every day. He turned and, and, and basically T-boned the group. How do you not see three to five people on the road and you're turning left to hit someone in the middle of the group? You know, that's this distracted driving that's going on. He, there's no way he was paying attention. And so, you know, she's in the hospital still. Her wrist and her ankle are injured and she she will probably need some surgery and she's bummed out because she's like man you know i like riding my bike you know she sent me a text we communicated i thought oh, don't worry about it just try to take the time it takes to heal you know her bike was damaged of course so you know we had just done her fit so i told her i said well don't worry about it because all we need to do is get the bike replaced the correct size everything else is easier so you're not dealing with you know, I said, right now, just focus on healing. You know, she misses just being out. She wants to get out of the hospital. It's not fun being in the hospital because, first of all, even after they treat you, they don't let you sleep. There's a nurse or somebody coming in every hour because they got to check on you. So you don't get really good rest in the hospital. <laughs> Those of you who have been there, you probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, when my kids were born, I spent the night in the hospital with my wife, and I was more tired than I'd ever been because every hour someone was coming in the room to check the kid you know that's what I'm talking about you did the, the nurses on staff that's they have to do their job they come in to make sure you you know you're okay and so it's not fun besides the fact the food ain't that great I mean they can't feed you what you eat out in the world because you're sick you know? and so yeah being sick is a bummer but I'm sure there are worse things so I just try to cheer her up. We're texting each other. So it's, it's good that she can text because one of one of her wrists were, were injured, you know. I don't know the extent of it at this point. But I kinda wanted to just stay in touch. You guys Mar Mary has been on the film here, Mary Walker. She's uh, one of our most enduring writers in the area. And, and Mary is uh, somebody that had, she had lights on the bike and everything. It was not an issue. Just imagine that someone's turning, whether you're walking or riding a bike, someone's turning into a street in this direction, turning left into a street. How do you not see cyclists in a line coming or a pedestrian or whoever? That means he wasn't paying attention. People get behind the wheel, I have seen. In fact, last weekend we went out of town and coming back on the highway, there was a lady looking at her phone at 70 miles an hour. Completely not looking at the road, looking down at the phone in her right hand. I tapped my horn, because it was a multi-lane highway. I tapped my horn, then she looked up, and then I pointed straight forward. How the heck are you gonna be driving at 70 miles an hour looking down towards the gear shift where your phone is? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know what killed you. <laughs> but we got a lot of that. And don't blame the phones. If it wasn't phones, it'd be a comic book or a newspaper or something. 
it's the attitude. It's the fact that they don't understand that it's dangerous or they don't care. So it's not the phone. It's not because it's there. It's if it weren't that, it'd be something else they'd be looking at. They don't respect 70 miles an hour. That you mess around. That's you know, it's, it's gonna do some damage. You don't even have to be that fast. Even at 30 miles an hour, you hit something at 30 miles an hour, it can kill you. You know, it's just it's how you hit, not necessarily the speed. The human body wasn't meant to take that kind of force. The organs in your body. You know. So yeah, um, you probably see it all the time. Distracted driving, and don't don't even couple it with those that are under the influence of something, and then they still think it's okay to operate this deadly vehicle, 4,000 pounds, you know, things that wouldn't do, be allowed to do in a factory. <laughs> you know, I worked in a warehouse. You couldn't even drive the forklift if you were sick, dizzy, or whatever. You'd be low par. They wouldn't let you drive the forklift because they didn't run, want, you, want you running into not only their goods, but damaging stuff in the warehouse. They don't mess around, you know, because they're 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 trying to make them keep the business safe, and they got OSHA and all those requirements, and maybe you know, our, you know, on the road, yeah, we got officers having to deal with DUI and all that kind of stuff, you know. But people continue to do stuff. It's funny, you know. We, all we got to do is coexist and keep our eyes out and watch out for them. That's all you can do. You can't stop living because uh, there are reckless people out there. So Mary, we hope you heal quickly. You know, unfortunately you are injured through no fault of your own. And so you are in our thoughts and we will say a, pr a prayer for you. I like this word because when you get on it, you are encouraged to work. Just something about it. So we don't have a perfect tailwind any, anymore because this road is not straight. That's another reason I like it. It snakes into town. It's like, you know, it's just windy, twisty, you know, it's got some tough sight lines. So when we need to, we take the lane. And some of them get impatient and they barely have enough room like that one. He barely had enough room to pass us because there was another car coming the other way. That car. But it, God forbid they have to wait for two seconds. The world will end. Look at that sky. Just look clean. The wind comes and just pushes everything away, you know? I like that. The wind clears the air, so we don't have to deal with smog where we live, because we don't have mountain ranges that traps it, you know? So all the crap we put out, the wind comes and pushes it out of the way to give us clean air to breathe, in spite of. I love this time of the year from now until May. I love being in Central Texas. The summers, you have to adapt, but they are very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh. So we've got the south, the north wind blowing us south. And we got the westerly wind on the right blowing into us, but it's mostly from behind. The one from the west is not as strong. But the northwesterly flow I love because it doesn't keep the temperatures frigid. It's cool.
cool, dry, but mild. We're already at 16 Celsius. So we're close to like 57, 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Nearing 60 there about. I think there's a guy behind us. There's a car behind us. He's being very patient. Uh, but he doesn't want to pass because, of course, there's a curve here. You see where I place myself so that they don't use in the lane. I use the edge here because I don't like riding on that. This is very rough. One of the, some of them are smoother than the others. That's not one of them. So I always use the edge there. So in a little bit, he's going to pass because it's going to clear up and he'll have a better line of sight. I see him in my mirror. I wave him. He doesn't go. And then there's a car coming. So he doesn't have enough room, I guess. But he, he could have gone. But he sat there. So I said, okay. That's fine. He wants to make that decision. That's fine. He had plenty of room. Stay to the right there so Paul can stay a little on my left as you can see because the wind is blowing from the right. The road will kick up here. I shift to a small ratio. Probably a 62 inch gear, a 39-17. want to keep the effort around 250 or so but it goes higher the road kicks up this is like a five percent point i think right before this pull it really bites here yeah, about five and they will level off they will kick up again So this time of year, I basically use my training wheels. And by training wheels, I mean the oldest pair of wheels that I have. They're very in very good condition. You don't want your training wheels to be crappy because you don't want to have mechanicals in the winter. It's a pain. It's already cold. Who wants to be messing with stuff on the road? So I use my strongest wheels and heavy tires. We have uh, I have Continental Ultra Sport on there, and then I've got an old pair of the GP 4000S or something like that. So just you know, oldest oldest tires. The old GP is on the front, on the rear. I've got a new pair of Continental Ultra Sport on there, and they're pretty good tires. I like them because I can put them on the trainer and they don't wear very easily. And then I have the trainer skewer on this bike. Because that way I can just put the bike on the trainer. With the, when the weather is like this during the week, I can just do an indoor workout quickly. So that's what I have on there. I don't have anything fancy or whatever. It does not make that big of a difference because I'm not doing something that's timed necessarily. Or, you know, a big uphill event or whatever. We're just right. So I don't worry too much about it. This winter time, I want to put my strongest equipment on there. I want to put things that will last. Don't put flimsy stuff. Don't put the fancy wheels on in the winter. Get something that's built strong and durable, you know? So you don't have problems when it's cold. It doesn't need to be very expensive. It just needs to be strong. switch them out when you do your bigger rides you can put the fancy stuff on you know your important rides and so forth so 
a slight grade here, so I stand. It feels good to stand. Relieves the muscles, it changes how you're working them. When you stand, avoid changing your line. Let the bike walk with you as you still track. kicks up right here then it's gonna curve and go to the, the traffic light at 2978 and it's a bit scraped up here but I stay in the middle here because the edge is a little trickier we got too many reflectors on that it's very narrow so when we get through quickly then I move a little over to the right getting pounded by the north wind so much because those trees on the left offer a little bit of shelter. Yeah, he'd been sitting there for a while. Waved him over. There are a couple of additional cars behind us but uh, they realize we're almost at the intersection so they wait there's a bunch of vultures on the right here at a funeral they're eating a deer <laughs> they're all in black <laughs> Really? Yeah, yeah well, I was telling Paul is we saw them on 1488 inside the body of the deer they were eating a deer from the inside out we saw them through the rib cage because all that was left was bones. They crawl inside the animal and eat. Yeah. So I was telling him about where we saw it. We were going to wow. West McDonald. He didn't notice it, but I, I saw it. They were crawling. I saw them inside the deer sitting there eating. <laughs> really, they're cleaners. They get rid of all these roadkill. If that's a car that hit that deer, a deer will dent your car. Those things uh, are significant enough. But I don't know what you did this weekend, but this is part of what we did on Saturday. Remember, get your K's in and keep the doctors far.